Lord, we thank you for your word and the opportunity to come together with like-minded folks to study it out, uh, to learn uh, the gems and the treasures that you have in there for us, uh, for the goal of helping equip us so that we can minister to others better and that we can see souls saved and, and strengthen and encourage each other to do the work that you'd call us to do. Amen. Okay. Back in the 1980s, I think, or 90s, there was these commercials for micro machines. You remember those? That guy that used to talk to micro machines? Uh, I'm going to try to do something tonight we've never done before, and that's cover three and a half chapters. So, uh, <laughs> and I will try not to speak like that guy. But um, we are covering Genesis 42 through 45 and a half um, tonight. And the reason why is because it really it does go together. Uh, it is the story of Joseph's brothers and them coming down to Egypt uh, during the famine and then Joseph eventually forgiving them and the redemption that they have bef uh, before Joseph. So that's what's going on tonight. And uh, if anything, after 45 lessons in Genesis uh, last year and then picking up the last couple months, uh, we should learn that there's a lot more in Genesis than simply Adam and Eve, creation, the flood, which is where m most people spend their time in Genesis, is with the, the first section, the first 11 chapters. And it's important to get that straight, and we spend a lot of time on that. But uh, we see there's three-fourths of Genesis that cover Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the fathers of Israel, and these last 12 chapters deal with Joseph and deal with the 12 tribes, the, the family heads, the 12 sons of Jacob. And particularly, as we're seeing, as it goes into more detail about their life than it did the, the, the previous chapters, the previous people, it's dealing with how God is forming this nation. Of course, he called Abraham out. He, he, he chose Isaac. He chose Jacob. And now Jacob has 12 sons. And these sons, uh, we saw in Genesis 37 and 38, are in disarray. Uh, Judah had sins that he was doing in chapter 38. Uh, his brothers sold Joseph into slavery in chapter 37. And uh, we saw Joseph in prison in chapter 39 and 40. And so we're starting to see the resolution of all this, where at the end of Genesis, what we have is a family, Jacob's family, and the 12 sons, and their family starting to grow as a unit, and they're together. And they're on board with the same goal, which is that God's going to, through them, bless the world. Okay, that's what we're going to see by the end of Genesis. And the famous phrase in Genesis 50 is, Joseph makes, is that you, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. And so we see a transformation here, uh, and particularly in these chapters, Genesis 42 through 45. Okay, so what's going on here is Joseph and the trial, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the tribulation that, that Jacob goes through, and the trial that Joseph puts his brothers through in order for them to repent and for them to come to uh, a state of reconciliation with Joseph. Okay, that's what's going on in these chapters. Now, these story, the story in these three chapters is one of the greatest stories in the Bible. Uh, you've heard the songs and the statements about the greatest story ever told being Jesus Christ and God putting on humanity, and this is true because it's our salvation. Uh, and yet, I told you before, as we studied, Joseph has so many parallels to Jesus Christ, and he's a, a type of Jesus Christ here in the Old Testament. And not just Joseph, but in this whole story here, we see instance after instance where it seems to elude and foreshadow, or, or at least illustrate, things that are going to happen in the future. And what's so significant about that is that Genesis was written thousands of years ago, uh, thousands of years before Jesus. And so uh, all of this was down in the Bible, in the Torah, in Israel's books, before all the prophecies about Jesus, and before Jesus came, and before he fulfilled all that. And yet we see all these parallels to him, as we'll see through the story here. And so this really is one of the greatest stories ever, ever told in the Bible. If you uh, are going to be a movie producer of Christian movies, uh, which I don't know if any of you are, this would be the one to make, and no one ever makes it. Uh, they always make Exodus, they always make uh, the Flood, or, or Jesus' earthly ministry, where the miracles are at, because those are where the exciting parts are at. Uh, if you made a movie out of these chapters, it would be a drama in uh, a, a king's court and in a famine. It just wouldn't be very exciting, but really, it is one of the greatest stories in the scripture. And so I'd encourage you to read it. I will not do it justice, because I'm not going to read you every word through the story. So read through it. It really is a very, uh, very, very interesting story. Um, what we have in Genesis 41, where we left off last time, was that Joseph went from a servant to a position of rulership and a savior, a savior of Egypt, okay? And so he went from prison to someone of power. That's in Genesis chapter 41. At the end of that chapter, it says in verse uh, 40, or 53, rather, that the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land were ended, uh, and the seven years of dearth began to come, 
And so when the famine came, uh, the land of Egypt had bread because of Joseph's wisdom and in his uh, economic policies and things like that. In verse 55, in the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said, go unto Joseph what he saith to you do. So recall last time, that's the same thing that Mary said about Jesus, right? When at the wedding feast, they ran out of the wine and, and she said, whatever he says, you do. Pharaoh says the same thing to Joseph here. Whatever he says, you do. And so Joseph starts to sell the bread that he had stored up in verse 56, which again is interesting because in the Bible, we're going to have in the kingdom and God's storehouses being poured out so there will not be any lack. And here's Joseph uh, being the one, as Hebrew, being the one distributing out of these storehouses. And he sells them to the Egyptians and the famine continued, and it says in verse 57, all the countries came into Egypt to Joseph to buy corn. So again, in the kingdom, when Christ is reigning, will all the countries come to Israel uh, for, their, for their sustenance? And this would be yes, and that's what we have back here in 4157, that they're all going to Joseph to buy corn. And the famine was sore in the land. Okay, so we have here Joseph, and he's a second under Pharaoh. He's a ruler in Egypt. And we have his two children being born. He's got a wife of one of the priests in Egypt. He's living a successful life by the world standards. It's a very happy time here, even in the famine. And then it switches to chapter 42 to Jacob, which is in the land of Canaan, where they're suffering because of the famine that has occurred. Okay, so here's the transition to Jacob, and he's experiencing trouble. And over the next three chapters, Jacob will experience trouble, not just because of the famine, but because of the loss of his sons and because of the sins of his sons. And, and, and then at the end of these three chapters, of course, he'll face that relief from his trouble. Now, famines in the Bible, we need to recognize something here. Uh, famines in the Bible are often used by God uh, to fulfill his purposes, but also to try or, or, or rather discipline his people. We see this in Leviticus 26 when God gave the covenant to Israel that he promised to bless them if they did good and obeyed the, the commandments. But if they did not obey the commandments, he, there would be curses and there would be punishment given to them. And one of those punishments frequently was famine or dearth. You would not have a, an abundant supply in your land. Okay. Now back here, we know that God's also involved in this famine uh, simply because in Psalm 105, verse 17, or 16 rather, uh, it says there that God called for a famine. And so we're seeing God's intervention through his story here to fulfill his purpose. Remember, we talked about that before, and we'll talk about it again. The reason why God intervenes in the Bible is always to fulfill his purpose. It is not that God is pulling all the strings behind the scenes of every butterfly's wing. It's that when he gets his purpose done, he intervenes to get it done. And we know how God intervenes because the Bible tells us how he intervenes. And we see in Psalm 105 that he intervened to call for this famine. He intervened to give Joseph the interpretation of the dreams. And we'll see here in a bit, he actually gave Joseph the dreams and started the whole story off. And he intervened to do that so that Israel would be saved. And that was the goal, that they would have life. Okay? And so famines have that purpose in the Bible. Uh, chapter 42, verse 1. Jacob's sitting there in the land of Canaan. He's missing his food because the famine is great. He looks at his sons who are sitting there staring at the wall and it says, why do you look on, upon each other? What are you looking around for? He says, go down to Egypt and get some corn. And because he hears his for, uh, food down there in Egypt. And so in verse 3, um, jo Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. Ten brothers because Joseph was in Egypt and Benjamin stayed home, who was the other son of Rachel. Remember, Rachel was, was, uh, was Jacob's uh, uh, wife that he loved the most, and his two sons by her, Benjamin and Joseph, were his, his beloved sons, right? Which is interesting. So Jacob's beloved sons are Benjamin and Joseph, and what we see is both of them are pictures of Jesus Christ, God's beloved son. And so we've, we've seen that before. But in verse 3, Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt, but Benjamin stayed home, and Jacob says, lest peradventure mischief befall him. So remember, he's had experience with mischief befalling his sons, right? But that wasn't really mischief. That was his sons lying to him and selling Joseph into slavery. Okay, and so he, Jacob's just taking the, the safe road here and leaving Benjamin home. This, of course, will fall into the plot of the trial here because Benjamin's going to be the key to their salvation. But in verse 5, it says, The sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came uh, of all the countries uh, of the land there, and the famine was in the land of Canaan. So the famine wasn't just a local famine in Egypt, it was, it was spread abroad, okay? Joseph, of course, was a governor in the land, and uh, it, it was he that sold the, the corn to the people in verse 6. Verse 7, Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them. So this is important, because this is where the brothers come to Joseph, and they're going to bow down to him, okay? They bow before him in, in verse 6, just like Joseph had dreamed. Remember back in chapter 37? 
where Joseph had the dreams of the, of the, the sheaves, and they stood upright before Joseph's sheaves, and then they bowed down before it, and his brothers hated him for that. And then he had another dream and said, I saw the sun and the, and the moon and the 11 stars, and they all bowed down to me. And they all hated him for that. And even Jacob kind of questioned whether he was getting a little too big for his britches back there in chapter 37. And so he had these dreams back in chapter 37. And here we see the fulfillment of these things happening, where Joseph sees his brothers, and they're bowing down before him, their faces to the earth. Okay, uh, Who did that, by the way? Who caused that to happen? Remember back in 38, God was with Joseph, God was with Joseph, and he made that happen. He made him prosper. Okay, But in, in verse 7, Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, and he made himself strange to them. So Joseph is not going to reveal himself to his brothers and say, hey, I remember you. Look who, where I'm at. Look where you're at. You know? He doesn't present this. You or I may do that. We may have been like, hey, you laughed before. Look at me now. Um, and there's a reason for that. Okay? Joseph is always pictured in this story as, as the one who's obedient to God and doing God's will. And what he's going to be doing the next three chapters is trying to bring his brothers into repentance. And he's going to do that by dealing harshly with them. And that's exactly how God deals with Israel in the Bible, is he deals harshly with them to bring them to repentance. Uh, even today when we preach the gospel, we need first to understand our sin before we understand God's grace. And so if Joseph would have just said, hey, you're my brothers, and look where I'm at, I'm better than you, here, have some corn, uh, would there have been any repentance, any confession, any guilt laid on them, or any redemption or reconciliation or anything? It would have been none of that. You see, what we see through this story is that. We see rags to riches, poverty to, to wealth, we see uh, repentance, confession, redemption, reconciliation, salvation, all in this story. Some commentators say, well, what you see in this story is the, the same story of our salvation, you know, sinners coming to repentance, a confession of their sin, and then we're saved by grace. Of course, you don't find the cross or anything back here, but you find some very interesting illustrations of it. We'll see later, Judas substitutes himself to die for his brother, right? And so other things that, that are in the story, just amazing uh, illustrations of, of, of our salvation. So Joseph knew his brethren, and he didn't just see them visually and say, oh, yeah, I know those guys. He also remembered what they did and who they were, and that's why he's going to do this. Okay, uh, He knows that his brothers, the last he saw them, were hateful, envious, uh, liars. Okay? They conspired to strip him of his coat. Remember that, that coat that he had that his dad gave him? They took his coat off right, and left him naked, put him in the pit. Okay? Going to leave him there. They were going to kill him. They threatened him with, with death. And then eventually Judah's idea was, we'll, we'll sell him, make a profit off of him. So they sold him. And all of this, they lied to their father about it and thus grieve Jacob for quite a while. So Joseph remembers them. He knows them. And thus it says he made himself strange to them. He did not reveal himself. If you recall, I mentioned, I think last week or the week before, yeah, last week, when he was brought before Pharaoh, they shaved him. So they may not recognize your brother if you've seen him with the beard his whole life. Who knows, you know. But they shaved him, and they put it, they, 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 he made himself strange to them and spake roughly unto them. And he said unto them, Why come ye? And they said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. And Joseph knew his brethren, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them and said, you are spies. He accuses them of being spies, which is very interesting because Joseph knows that they're liars and that they're haters and that they're envious of him and that they sold him and threatened to kill him. And he says, you're liars. You're, secret. you're dealing in secret right now. You're spies. Okay? He calls them out for the, sin that they, the sins that they, were actually, they actually did. Now, of course, they didn't come there in this instance as spies, but he's, he's immediately bringing it for them, you guys are wicked. Okay? And this is the beginning of this process, of this transformation of his brothers. Okay? He says, you're spies. Of course, they respond, no, we're not. We came here to buy food. And so, when we read God's word, and, and the God's word says, you're a sinner, uh, our temptation is to say, no, we're not. I didn't do anything bad. I'm at church tonight. You know, uh, what did I do bad? Well, oh, you forgot, apparently. You know, 20 years ago, <laughs> say 20 years ago, can't we let bygones be bygones? Well, they're, they're sinners, you see, and they, they've not yet been atoned for their sins. So uh, he says, you're spies. They argue back and say that, that he's not. But he's dealing harshly with them here. Down in verse 21, we're going to skip some of these verses. He accuses them of being spies. They argue and say that we're not, and part of that is because of their lie. They say, we're all the same man. We're all the sons of the same man. And then he asks them again. He says, there's 12 of us, and actually one's dead and one's at home. And he says, you can't even have the same story. You can't keep the story straight. And so uh, he says, that's proof that you're spies. It's proof that you're lying. He puts them all in prison for three days. And so just as uh, Joseph was hated of his brothers and thrown in a pit, 
is stripped of their clo his clothes. He takes these guys, accuses them of wrongdoing, puts them in the ward, the prison, for three days. Okay. He actually says at the beginning that one of you is going to go back and get your younger brother Benjamin, or he didn't say Benjamin, your youngest brother, uh, to prove that you are not spies, that what you said was the truth, not just a lie. Okay. And so what he eventually does is brings them out of the prison and says, I'm not going to send one of you back. I'm going to keep one of you and send all of you, uh, send uh, the rest of you back. But before he does that, look in verse 21. Verse 21. They said one to another in their own language, by the way, the Hebrew language. They spoke to Joseph in the Egyptian language. Uh, verse 21. We are verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. Therefore is this distress come upon us. So what's happened here is that here's this Pharaoh's aid. Here's the second in command. Accuse them of being spies. Sentence them with death and saying, you will die before Pharaoh if it's found that you're spies. You have to prove yourself innocent, right? Which is kind of opposite of our justice system today where you're innocent until proven guilty. He accuses them of being guilty and thus Pharaoh's word says they're going to die unless they can prove themselves to be innocent, okay? And these brothers turn to, them, turn to each other. And in their own language, their Hebrew language, they're, they're afraid. And they start speaking this. And they say, this is what's happened. This distress has come upon us. Because remember our brother? We sold him into slavery. We did wrong. We, we killed him. And now God's, this is divine retribution is what this is. Now we're the outlaws. Now we're the ones that are threatened with death. So they immediately recognize this. Reuben in verse 22 says, Spake I not unto you before, chapter 37, saying, Do not sin against the child, and you would not hear. Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. Reuben back there, if you recall, uh, always trying to protect himself in, in, the, in the eyes of, uh, of other people and hide his, his secrets, uh, desires, was, was trying to get his brothers not to kill Joseph in order to make himself look better before his father, who he had sinned previously. Okay. He agreed, though, to sell him. That, you know, that, that, that was, or to keep him in the pit, rather. But Reuben says, I told you so. The three greatest words in the English language, right? I told you so. I told you. He says, I told you not to do this. And, and now his blood is required of us which again speaks to the future lesson that we learn in the Bible that you know, wages of sin is death and blood is required. Blood for blood, right? They killed Joseph, blood is required to cover this sin. So where's that gonna come from? And right now it's from them. They have to pay for it, okay? Verse 23, and they knew not that Joseph understood them for he spake unto them by an interpreter. And Joseph then knowing Hebrew, and Egyptian. They were speaking Hebrew. Uh, he knew what they were saying and hears their guilt, their expression of guilt. So this is going to be something that comes up over and over again tonight. You'll see that every time Joseph weeps, his brothers take another step closer to redemption. Okay, he weeps four or five times in the story. And it's always after his brothers make some sort of confession or some sort of a, a sign of integrity or some sort of a, a necessary step towards redemption. Okay. And so they didn't know that Joseph understood them when they, when they talked about him <laughs> in front of them in Hebrew and how they were guilty and how they shouldn't have done it. And Reuben, who was the oldest of the sons, said, I told you guys not to do this. He was the oldest, right? And so Joseph takes the second oldest, Simeon, who didn't say anything against taking him, you know, puts him in the prison and, and lets the rest of them go. Something else that's interesting here is a side note in Genesis 42 where it says that uh, he spake to them by an interpreter. Okay. What we have in the book of Genesis is a book written in Hebrew. It's all in Hebrew. Well, Genesis is in Hebrew. Okay. You have Aramaic in the Old Testament and elsewhere, but Genesis is written in Hebrew. And yet what's recorded here in Hebrew, God's inspired words, is Egyptian. Okay. And so understand that words can be translated to other languages divinely inspired. You understand? So the inspired Hebrew was originally Egyptian and God inspired it into Hebrew and preserved it in the Jewish religion. Okay, just some, a side note there when you're talking about Bible translation and things like that. People often say, well, we can't know we have God's word in English. We can know we have God's word in English because God invented language, you see. And though he gave uh, the scripture in the New Testament in Greek, uh, uh, it can be translated. And you can understand what it means to be saved by grace through faith without knowing a word of Greek. You see. So anyway, I don't want to spend all night on that, but that's just an interesting uh, star next to that verse there. So Joseph uh, lets all of the brothers go, nine of them, leaves Simeon there locked up in prison, so they're minus one, sends them back home to get Joseph, and he actually gives them corn so that they can survive the famine, at least for a bit. Remember, the famine's going to be seven years. Okay, so he gives them corn to survive a bit of the famine, and he actually gives their money back, puts it back into their bags, unbeknownst to them. All right, uh, this is going to come up later as well. And so they left, and uh, we, we need to go down to, oh, Zechariah chapter 12. See, Zechariah. 
Yeah, Zechariah 12. Because what we see here with the admission of guilt of killing Joseph is going to picture something in Israel's future. Zechariah 12, verse 10. You may know the verse where it says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And there'll be great mourning in Jerusalem. Zechariah 12 is talking about the Messiah, talking about when Israel, in that future time when Christ returns to them after his death, They'll look at him, whom they pierced, and they'll mourn. Okay? What we're seeing it back here in Genesis 42 is a similar thing, where the brothers here of Joseph uh, picture the remnant of Israel in the time of Jacob's trouble, which is first defined back here in Genesis 42 and 43, going through that tribulation, and Joseph hears Jesus Christ, and they're standing before him, and they're guilty. They said, we killed him before. Now, they don't know that's Joseph there yet. But that's what they're doing. And so this is what God's going to do with Israel as he brings them through the tribulation. They're going to, have to go through a similar trial and a famine of things. And they're going to have to come to a point where if they don't have Jesus, if they don't trust Jesus Christ and put their faith in him, they're not going to that kingdom. They're not getting redemption. They're not getting salvation. Same thing with his brothers here. Joseph's trying to lead them through this understanding, through this time of trouble. And so Zechariah 12, 10 is something to remember. Uh, you recall also Israel... Uh, was guilty of Jesus' blood in Matthew 27 when Pilate said, his blood's not on my hands. You guys want to kill him? You kill him. And they said, his blood be on our hands is what the Jews said, what Israel said. Matthew 27. Okay? And that's exactly what the brothers confessed to in Genesis 42 and they said, we have, we, you know, we've killed our brother and thus his blood is required of us. Right? So you see they're admitting the guilt there. So you see an interesting parallel. What's also interesting is that Joseph requires that they bring Benjamin in order to be saved, in order to get more corn, to get life. They have to bring Benjamin to him. Why Benjamin? Well, it's interesting. Benjamin, back there when Rachel birthed Benjamin, his original name was Benoni, which means son of sorrow. Benjamin is often a picture of Jesus in his first coming when he came to die as that suffering servant. Joseph is a picture of Jesus in his second coming because he's the king, he's the ruler, right? So he has to bring Benjamin. In order to get into that kingdom, you've got to bring your faith in, the, in, in Jesus Christ, the one who suffered for you, right? It's also interesting that Paul is of the tribe of Benjamin. And so Paul is the one that preaches grace to the world and salvation to the world. And without trusting God's grace, no one has salvation. So it's, it's interesting. Again, there's no doctrine in the Bible teaching this, but you see the similarities and interesting illustrations here where here you have these ten brothers, and without Joseph, without Benjamin, they can't be saved. They're doomed. Okay, so they have to go home and get him. So that's what's going on. In verse 28, what happens when they get uh, on the way home, they open up some of their sacks, they see that there's money in there that they, uh, that they intended to pay for the corn, and now they're afraid. It says in verse 28, my money is restored, and lo, it is even in my sack, and their heart failed them. Over and over again in the story, their brothers are afraid when they see things happening. They say, what's this money doing in the bag? He's going to think we stole it. Not only does he accuse us of spying, now we're going to be thieves. And he says, what is this that God hath done to us? So again, you see how they're looking at God doing these things to them. You know, this is divine retribution going on here. Okay? Now this is not something they're doing about everything in their life, but they recognize their guilt that they did toward Joseph and that God is now seeking them out. Okay? So they went to, uh, to Jacob in the land of Canaan. They told him all that, they, that, all that happened. Um, they, they talk about how they were accused of being spies and how they, they, they told him that we were of the same man. And they said that... that uh, uh, that he gave us some of the, uh, the food for our family in verse 33. In verse 34, like an afterthought, they said, and we've got to bring our younger brother back to him or else we're going to die. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, of course, this is the big problem. Jo Jacob says that that's not going to happen. You're not taking Benjamin at all. Jacob, their father, said, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not. Simeon is not. You will take Benjamin away also. All these things are against me. He says, all my children are leaving. Simeon's gone. He's counting Simeon gone. I'm not going to go get him. And you're going to take Benjamin too? He's just grieving here. Jacob is in trouble. Okay? Jeremiah 30 verse 7 talks about the time of Jacob's trouble and actually refers to the future time of Israel when they will go through a time of trouble, referring back here where they're in trouble. Israel needs saved. They don't have any food. Their children are they're being taken. Right? Jacob thinks his children are dead. They're gone is what he thinks. Right? What happens to these lost tribes? Well, they're not gone. Right? 
And so in Genesis chapter 42 here, Jacob says, you're not going to take him. Verse 37 is interesting, which he's been one minute on, that Reuben, the eldest, again, trying to, uh, I don't know why he's trying to do this. He's, he's constantly trying to make himself uh, appear to be better than perhaps what he is. But Reuben makes the suggestion, look, I'll go take Benjamin down there, and I promise, if I don't bring Benjamin back, you can kill my sons. Which is odd, because why would any grandfather want to kill their grandchildren? And why would your children be guilty of your own sins? It's just totally absurd that he would offer this. It may seem like a sacrifice, but he's not facing any consequences. And so I guess the spiritual lesson there, and moral lesson, is consider and be cautious of taking advice from someone who doesn't have to face the consequences of the decision, like Reuben here. Oh, sure, yeah, go ahead and take him, because if you don't bring him back, you still live, and your sons die? Of course, Jacob you know, responds that that's not going to happen. My son's not going to go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone. If mischief befall him by the way in which we, ye go, then shall you bring down my gray hairs to the grave. So I'm going to die if Benjamin do, if leaves and doesn't come back. So you're not taking him. Okay, that, that's, that's not what's going to happen. Chapter 43, then the story continues. The famine was sore in the land. The corn that Joseph gave them didn't last very long. Perhaps that was Joseph's uh, planning. Perhaps he intended not to give them corn for seven years, just perhaps for a short time until they had to make another decision about bringing Joseph, uh, Benjamin back or not. So the famine uh, waxed on. It was sore in the land. It came to pass when they had eaten up the corn. Their father said, go again and buy a little food from Egypt. Judah reminds him that we can't go back without Benjamin. We're, accu we're, we're criminals. We're accused of, of, of uh, um, a, a crime of de unto death. And unless we bring back Benjamin, we're not going to see the face of Pharaoh again. Okay? Or, or Joseph, rather. And so uh, Jacob again mourns and grieves for this, this, this problem, this trouble he's facing, that he either has to give up his son Benjamin or die without food. Uh, eventually, Judah makes a suggestion down in verse... Uh, where are we in verse 8? Where it says, Judah said unto Israel, his father, send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. If I bring him not unto thee, and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. You see what he says? Much different than what Reuben said. Yeah. And isn't this much different than what Judah acted like in chapter 38? Remember chapter 38, where he left his father, didn't care much for his heritage, married a Canaanite woman, and then, you know, uh, practiced prostitution and this sort of thing, fornication. And, and then at the end of chapter 38, remember how he recognized that I'm the sinner? Is I'm the sinner, and he, and he would face the consequences? Apparently, this guy's changed. Not only is he back from being in the land of, uh, among the Canaanites but with his family, but he's now going to lead his family. He's going to make the sacrifice necessary for his family to exist. He says, look, if we don't go back, we're going to die. We should have gone back sooner. The reason why he didn't is because his father said, Benjamin's not going to go. But Judah says, I will be the sacrifice for Benjamin if he doesn't come back. Okay? So there's a substitute right there. He's a surety for him. Such a change of character in Judah. Um, because of this, Jacob submits to God's will in the matter, apparently. Okay, uh, down in verse uh, 11, Jacob said, It must be so now, do this. Take of the best fruits of the land, take some spices, honey, myrrh, nuts, almonds, take double money, and take Benjamin. And uh, he, he says down in verse 14, God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and, and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. You see, Jacob's just kind of giving it up to God, saying... God's going to do it. If he wants to take my children, he's going to take my children. That's just how it's going to be. Okay. And so Jacob submits himself to God in his grief, this time of trouble, which again, if you think about the picture that we were talking about of Israel going through the time of trouble in the future, what are they going to do? When it looks like everything's being taken away from them and God's not going to fulfill their promises because they've got to sell everything they have and being chased by the Antichrist and everything else, well, they're going to have to submit to God. If God wants that to happen, it's going to happen. We need to trust God in it. And that's what Israel will need to do during that tribulation, like Jacob does here, okay, during the time of his trouble. And so in verse 15, they took the double money, they took all the gifts, they took Benjamin down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. And uh, verse 16 says, When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home and slay, slay animals, and make ready, for these men shall dine with me at noon. So here's... Here's an interesting picture. You got these guys coming down the road. Joseph sees them coming down the road like he's looking for them and says, hey, prepare the dinner. 
which I don't know about you, but it reminds me a lot of the story of the prodigal son. You know, again, maybe I'm grasping at straws here, but Luke 15, you've got the prodigal son where he comes back after uh, not having anything to eat. Remember that? He's eating pig slop, right? And he comes back because he's starving. These guys are starving too. And he comes back and his father sees him and then tells his servants to go make a dinner because the son's home and then goes out and hugs him and this sort of thing, right? Where he have Joseph and he sees this brother's coming and he says, hey, go kill the fatted calf. We're going to have some dinner tonight. My brothers are back. Okay, so it's, it's interesting how you see some of these similar events happening. Okay, in verse uh, 17, the man did as Joseph bade, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house. And verse 18, the men were afraid. Why are they afraid? Why are they afraid? They're constantly afraid. Of course, they're afraid because remember what happened to the sacks? They got all the money in there. And so the last time they came to pay for corn, they left still with their money. <sighs> What's this guy going to think? And Joseph asked for them to come into his house. They didn't, like, go beg for him or anything like that. So what's he thinking? He obviously knows something is up. So they're afraid, which uh, tells you a couple things. Number one, of Joseph's power. But number two, when you've sinned, you live in fear when you've sinned. When you've sinned, you live in fear of those in authority constantly, and, which is why you need forgiveness and you need salvation. Because when you have salvation and forgiveness, you can live in peace Right? When you don't and you live in sin, you're constantly in fear, afraid of everything. Every circumstance is a bad thing. You go back there with the, the sacks and where Joseph puts the, the money back in the sacks. You could look at that and say, wow, that's a gracious thing Joseph did. Right? But if you're the brothers and you committed the sin, you're thinking the worst. Right? Now we're thieves. You know? They come back and they, they appear before Joseph's house and they say, oh, we're afraid. What's going to happen? And they start explaining. They say in verse 18, they say, well, you know, we had the money and we came back and it just happened to be there. And so we, got, we brought it back to you, double money, you know. They start explaining their, what had happened. And um, it says in verse 19, they came near to the steward's house. They opened it up and they start explaining. Uh, where is it? Down in verse 23. The steward says, peace be to you. Fear not. Your God and the God of your father have given you treasure in your sacks. So here's the sinners, and they're, they're thinking the worst. And the steward of Egypt goes, I didn't do it. <laughs> um, I got your money, is what he says. He says, I have your money. God must have done that for you. And he brought Simeon out. So Simeon was the prisoner that Joseph kept, kept and brought him out and brought him to, to, to them. And then uh, the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water, washed their feet, gave their asses provender, food, and they made ready the present against Joseph at noon. For they'd heard there'd be bread there. So when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their, the, in their hand to the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. So here's the second time they're bowing to Joseph. Okay, just like the dreams had been. Okay. Um, what we have here then, they answered, thy servant our father is in good health after Joseph asked about Jacob. And they bowed down a third time. They lift up his eye, uh, Joseph lifts up his eyes and he sees Benjamin. And uh, he says, is this, is this the brother whom you spoke of? Uh, verse 30, he sees Benjamin. He can't hold himself back anymore. So remember before he wept, when the brothers admitted they were guilty at killing Joseph, he said, bring your younger brother back. They hadn't been back for some while, apparently, because they went, stayed home and ate the corn, right, until they're, they're done with the corn. And so now they're back, and they brought Benjamin back. Benjamin's still alive. For all Joseph knew, he was dead. He was the only remaining child of Rachel, and his brothers hated Joseph. Why wouldn't they hate Benjamin? So here's Benjamin, and he sees him. So another step towards redemption his brothers take, bringing him back, right? So he, he, he makes haste and goes and hides behind the curtain or wherever he goes. He says in his room, his chamber, and he weeps, and he wept there. He washes his face, he comes back out, and he goes, let's eat, set on bread. And so they set on for him by himself and for them by themselves and for the Egyptians, which did eat with them by themselves, because the Egyptians would not eat bread with the Hebrews because they thought it was an abomination which is just an interesting historical tidbit. Verse 33, they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth, and the men marveled one at another. And so what we have here is Joseph setting these brothers down from oldest to youngest, which is fascinating because uh, the brothers were born sometimes very short times apart because there was multiple wives, remember? And so you really couldn't tell by looking at it, especially if someone looked older or younger than that they did when they were born. And here's this guy setting them up in order. And they marveled at this. No doubt this guy knows information or is smarter or some sort of diviner or whatever. This is, this is a marvel thing. And he took and sent messes unto them from before him, but Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs, and they drunk and were merry with him. So here we have this feast. They don't know who Joseph is. All they know that they're now eating together with him. 
Um, and in chapter 44, we're going to see once again, Joseph tries the integrity of his brothers. Okay? His brothers throw him in a pit. Joseph throws them in prison. Right? His brothers intended to kill him. Joseph says, you're going to die if you don't prove your innocence. Okay? Uh, they sold Joseph into slavery. And now Joseph's going to say, we'll see how you do uh, when I make it look like you just sold your brother and give you an, op an opportunity to relieve yourself of Benjamin and see how they respond to that. And so, um, chapter 44 here. Put a note in your outline, which I, I don't have time, I think, to get into much, but it's interesting that this whole section, this whole story in Genesis 42, 43, 44, um, the brothers are constantly afraid. Joseph's constantly weeping. Uh, here we have a, a small little glimmer of hope in that they're eating and being merry with Joseph. But this whole time is, is this kind of time of suffering for Jacob and his family and his brothers. There's going to be uh, a light at the end of the tunnel. There's going to be redemption. There's going to be salvation. And um, you take away from that that all throughout the prophecy in the Bible where it talks about turn your uh, mourning into joy, right? And your tears into laughter. And this is God's promise for Israel. And we see this back here as well, where you have mourning and you've got weeping and you've got this suffering and this, this sin and this guilt. And God's going to take that. He's going to eventually turn that in, into joy. Okay. Chapter 44. Let's move on. Two chapters already. He commanded the steward of, ho of his house, saying, Fill the men's sacks with food as much as they can carry and put every man's money in his sack's mouth. And put my cup, the silver cup, in the sack's mouth of the youngest. And so you, if you've read the story before, you know about this. He, Joseph puts the money back into the bags, which, again, they were supposed to bring the money to pay for the food, remember. And, and also Joseph secretly puts his cup, his silver cup, into Benjamin's bag uh, in order to set them up to see how they're going to respond when Benjamin is going to be taken captive. Okay, He's going to be uh, taken away from Joseph. Now, if they were of the same mind as they were before, uh, resenting Rachel's children, resenting Joseph, resenting the sons that Jacob loved, and resenting Benjamin, uh, that would have been a prime opportunity. Just let him go. Because Joseph's going to let his brothers go and leave Benjamin. He's going to take Benjamin. So it's a prime opportunity for them to say, Jacob, we, you know, he took him from us. We couldn't do anything. Right? And he's setting this up. So as soon as the morning came, the men went away. And in verse 4, they were gone out of the city. And not yet far, the Joseph said to his steward, he says, Go up to them and, and ask them, Why have you rewarded evil for good? And then, uh, uh, it is not this it which my Lord drinks? And, 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 you know, find the cup. And then this sort of, he tells the steward to do this. And the steward does it. He goes there and he, he asks them, Why have you done this evil when we've done so much good for you? And uh, down in verse 7 and 8, uh, they say, God forbid that thy servant should do according to this thing. So we haven't done anything. Okay. He says, we brought money to pay you. And look at the money in our bags. That's the same money we brought you. We didn't steal anything from Joseph's house. This is all Hebrew money, Canaanite money. And then in verse uh, 9, they say, With whomsoever of thy servants it be found to steal what you say they stole, let him die, and let us be your servants. If it's true, we stole something. They're so confident they did not do wrong at this point. Okay, and he said, now also let it be according to your words, the steward said. If we find something in your bags, the person's going to die. And so they took every man's sack off the ground, and they eventually found the cup in Benjamin's sack in verse 12. And immediately, they found the cup in Benjamin's sack, and the, the deal was he would die, and, and they would take him in, in, in as prisoner, and that sort of thing. And as soon as they found him in the sack, verse 13, then the brothers rent their clothes. They, they tore them. All right, they rent their clothes and laid every man on his ass and returned to the city. Now, they didn't have to return to the city. They were innocent. Benjamin was guilty, right? So the steward takes Benjamin. Now the brothers are going, what? And so they get on and go back to the city, and Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, and here we have the time of redemption for Joseph's brothers. Okay, because at the crucial point here where Benjamin's gone, they're free to go, and yet they go back into the city, the place where they were afraid, remember, right, to Joseph, and Judah's going to speak to this guy to his face, Joseph right? The, the Pharaoh's aid. And he's going to, to exchange himself for Benjamin, for his father's sake and for his family's sake, not for his own sake, right? And that's the point when redemption comes entirely. Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house, for he was yet there, and they fell before him on the ground, bowing again, fulfilling the dreams that Joseph had in chapter 37. Joseph said unto them, What deed is this that ye have done? What ye not, that such a man as I can certainly divine, divine I can see and know things, Right? 
And so he was a wise man. And verse 16, Judas said, What shall we say unto my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how shall we clear ourselves? God hath found out the iniquity of thy servants. So he immediately does not say, We've done nothing. You're a cruel king. You're wicked to judge us. And what does he say? He says, God hath found out our iniquity. Remember they said two chapters earlier that the reason why these things were happening is because of retribution for what they had done wrong years previously. And so Judah just, he just openly confesses. And it takes courage to do that. Okay? It takes leadership to do that. You don't hide from your mistakes. You don't hide your sins from a God who can see all. You confess them to him. right? And you throw yourself down before him and say, we beg for mercy because that's all we can do. And that's what Judah does. Okay? He doesn't try to snake his way out. He doesn't try to, to, to manipulate the situation. He says, God hath found out the iniquity of, of, of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also, with whom the cup is found, Benjamin and us. We're all together in this, and we're all guilty. Right? Is what he says. You see the unity there? Judah's not going to leave his brothers behind. He already promised Jacob. Very different than J Judah before chapter 38. And all the brothers are there. They didn't agree to do some sort of con uh, conspiracy to leave some there and go. They're all there together saying, we're all guilty and you found us out. God has found us out. He says, God forbid uh, that I should do so, Joseph says. He says, I am not going to keep you all here as my slaves. Only Benjamin is the one, only that guy, the youngest one, is the one who stole the cup. And he says, let not thine anger... Um, or in verse 17, rather, he says, He shall be my servant, and as for you, get you up in peace unto your father. He says, you guys get out of here. You guys leave, he's staying here. So again, Joseph presses the issue and says, you guys aren't the guilty ones in this matter. Benjamin is, he's staying, you're leaving, get out. Right? Again, opportunity. The brothers could have said, our hands are tied. We can't do anything, and leave. But what do they do? Against an Egyptian pharaoh, okay, who's not going to let Benjamin go. Well, that sounds interesting. A pharaoh that won't let his people go. But we have here, in verse 18, Judah comes near unto him. So now Judah separates himself from his brothers and stands before Joseph directly. He says, I'm going to speak to you man to man now. Right? And he says, My Lord, let your servants, I pray thee, speak a word in your ears. Let not thine anger burn against me, so don't strike me dead, because I'm talking to you this way. I mean, remember, this is second under Pharaoh. You don't look at Pharaoh. That's why their faces are on the ground. Okay, remember what Moses and Pharaoh and their interactions? You don't speak to Pharaoh like Moses did when he said, let my people go. You don't do that. You don't tell Pharaoh anything. He tells you things, right? And so here he walks up to Joseph and he says, don't strike me dead. Don't be angry at me, but I've got to tell you something, right? And he starts telling him the story of how he, they have a father back home and he had two sons from Rachel, from his beloved wife, and one of those sons is gone and no more. He's dead, and this is his only other son, and we, he says, I can't go back without him. And he says down in verse 22, the lad cannot leave his father, for if he would leave his father, his father would die. Why does Judah care so much about his father? For the 38, he left him. Right? And we see the, the change or the transformation. In verse 23, thou saidst unto servants, except your youngest brother come down with you, you shall see my face no more. And so you gave us the, the, the situation that we had to bring him down, but Jacob, he's going to die if we don't bring him back. So we're in this, this situation. It came to pass when we came up unto thy servant that uh, my father, we told him the words of my Lord, and our father said, go again and buy some food. We told him what you said. And I, he says down in verse uh, 30, in verse 31, uh, I think it's those there. Yeah, 30 and 31. Therefore, when I come to thy servant, my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life is bound up in the lad's life, it shall come to pass when he sees not Benjamin, that he will die. And your servant shall bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow unto the grave. And so he says that if we don't come back with Benjamin, Jacob's going to die. And they understand the promise God made with Jacob and understand the, the purpose that God has for their family. And they're trying to operate in this purpose, as we've seen before. They know God's will and they're trying to keep it. And so they're withstanding the most powerful man in the world at this time to do it. Okay. And he says in verse 32, For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father. So he even says that I've sacrificed my life. I'm, I signed on the dotted line. I became a surety, saying, If I bring him not unto thee, then I shall bear the blame to my father forever. But he doesn't say that to save himself or to, to express some sort of obligation on Joseph. What he says next is the key point. He says, I am the one that promised to bring him back and laid down my life. And so he makes a suggestion now. Judah makes a suggestion that instead of Benjamin... 
I'm going to stay here. Okay, kill me. In verse 33, Now therefore I pray thee, let thy servant abide instead of the lad, a bomb unto the Lord, and let the lad go up with his brethren. For how shall I go to my father, and the lad be not with me? Lest peradventure I see the evil that shall come to my father. He so much loves his father now, and the brothers so much love his father, that they're not going to leave there without Benjamin. They don't want to see him dead. And they so much love Benjamin that they're willing to die for him, right? Obviously, something has changed in these people and that they've ex expressed their guilt. They've changed their mind, it's repentance, towards what they've done and are behaving differently as a result, right? This is a total transformation. And not only that, we see a unity of the brothers now because they're all together trying to preserve the family. And that's what Joseph was trying to do at the beginning, right? Joseph, in fact, he'll explain in this next chapter, that's why I'm here. God brought me here to save the family, to save us all. And so in verse 34, this is the last straw. So Joseph begins to weep again. We should tell you in the story that uh, the brothers are closer to redemption, right? And, uh, and yet after the mourning comes the joy. Uh, in verse 45, verse 1, Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried. Because, so he didn't even leave. He just started breaking down. Because every man, t and he says, cause every man to go out from me. So he tells everyone to leave except for his brothers. Everyone else are the Egyptians, right? So he's, not, he's going to here reveal himself and reveal that he's the one they sold into slavery. But he doesn't want to make known to these Egyptians that whole situation and all the sordid past events that were going on. So he tells all the Egyptians to go out. And he's crying, you know, doing all this. And, and in verse 3, uh, uh, Verse 1 there, it says, He made himself known unto his brethren. Okay? It's only in Zechariah 12, verse 10, when Israel um, mourns for the one whom they have pierced and is able to endure to the end, confesses their guilt. What's First John 1, 9 say? If they confess their sins, he's able and just to forgive their sins, which is a quote of Leviticus 26, which under the law says if they confess their sins, then God will remember the promises made to the fathers. We see back here as well. When their sins are confessed and they're willing to die, as Revelation 2 says about Israel, you're willing to die for me, and many do die in the tribulation, then salvation comes, you see. And here's Joseph, and he reveals himself. So, whereas before they were afraid of Joseph's power, and he, the Egyptians, and the famine, and everything else, now suddenly when they learn that Joseph is, <laughs> their brother is the Pharaoh, I mean, that's a big relief. That's salvation. So in the tribulation, when you see the most powerful man in the world, against Israel, and they endure to the end and trust God and confess their sins. And then at the end, who's the most powerful man at the end of the tribulation? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the king of kings. He's going to, the rock from heaven, come to destroy all the other kingdoms, and he's on their side, you see. So it's a, a similar scenario. In verse 2, he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard him in the other room weeping so loudly. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? He didn't want his father to die either. He was weeping for his brothers. He was weeping for his father. He said, I don't want my father to die. And so he says, his brother could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. They, they were scared. What? Joseph, what are you talking about? This is, isn't this a resurrection from the dead? Right? In their eyes it is. They killed him. And here's Joseph. He's alive. They were, they were afraid. They didn't know what to see, what, what they were looking at. And so Joseph keeps talking, and he says, brethren, come near to me. James says, draw near to the Lord, and he'll draw near to you. That's what James says. To the remnant, by the way. James is written to the twelve tribes of Israel. And Joseph says, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom ye sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves. Instead of Joseph saying, look where I'm at, look where you're at, bowing down to me. Instead of Joseph condemning them, which he has every right to do, and he has every power to do, Joseph led them through this trial of repentance and confession and redemption until now. He says, don't be grieved, don't be angry. All is forgiven, right? And so he uses the power not to judge them, but rather to forgive them. And it says, I pray you, um, or in verse 5 rather, he says, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me here. For God did send me before you to preserve life. life. It just says life, <laughs> preserve life. What's he talking about? Remember back two chapters ago, or four chapters ago now, where Joseph, when he prophesied and interpreted, rather, Pharaoh's dream about the seven good years, seven bad years? If it was not for Joseph, or God, rather, giving Joseph the interpretation and becoming a ruler in Egypt, the Egyptians would have faced the famine. They would have been wiped out. 
And so Joseph said to Pharaoh, I've, I've come to save you, apparently. <laughs> God is going to save you, is what Joseph said, right? And then here we see in these chapters, it's not Egypt that God was focused on, it was Israel, right? The small little group of people, 70 people we'll see in the next chapter, who were in the land of Canaan, and God had promised that they would be a mighty nation and rule over nations. And here's Joseph, and he's the ruler of Egypt. And he says, God sent me before you to preserve life, your life, the Egyptian's life, to preserve life. Who came to give life into the world? Jesus Christ, right? Where do you go to get life? Jesus Christ. And Joseph says, God has preserved me, has sent me here before you, right? When does the kingdom come? Before or after Jesus Christ dies on the cross to give life? After. So God sent Christ into the world first before the kingdom in order for life to come, okay? And so he says, he sent me before you preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land. So it's only been two years into the famine. So again, you refer back to Joseph giving them grain or corn. It was only a, a bit. It wasn't enough to last all seven years. And he says, there shall be five more years yet in which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. So you're not going to be able to eat food for five years. And so I am here able to provide for you because God has sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. That means more than one thing, one deliverance, I think. Not just food deliverance, but spiritual deliverance. I mean, these guys were carrying around that guilt about Joseph for a while, apparently. And now <laughs> they've gone through this trial of confession and guilt and reconciliation. And he says, I'm here to deliver you, right? It's all dealt with, okay? Great deliverance is what he says. Uh, of course, that, that's a reference also to Psalm 105, where we covered before, God had sent Joseph into Egypt. And he explains the same thing here. Well, even though Judah and the brothers sold him into slavery, it, Psalm 105 says God sent him there. So even though Judah planned wickedness and his brothers planned evil to Joseph, God had a purpose behind the scenes. And by behind the scenes, I mean he hadn't yet revealed it until here. How did God do that? Did God make Judah sin? The Calvinists would say so, right? And no, that's what the Bible says. God didn't make Judah sin. It would be much better if they did not sell their brother into Egypt. But how, why were the brothers angry at Joseph? Because of dreams that Joseph had, remember? It says they would not speak to Joseph because they couldn't hold... In Genesis, look at Genesis 37. Genesis 37, verse 4, it says, When his brethren saw that their father loved Joseph more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him because his father loved him more. And Joseph dreamed a dream. And when he told them the dream, they hated him the more. And what did they say when they saw Joseph walking to them? They said, there's the dreamer of dreams. Who gave Joseph those dreams? That's interesting. So God intervenes and uses these wicked brothers as a, as a, as a, a tool, as a means to get what needs to happen done, and he doesn't make them do it. You know what he did with Israel? He sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross, didn't he? Did he make Israel put him on the cross? He didn't. Right? Did Jesus Christ die for the sins of Israel? He did. Right? Those people who nailed Jesus to the cross could have been forgiven. Jesus said on the cross, forgive them. They know not what they do. Right? But he had to die. Joseph had to get to Egypt. His brother sold him there and tried to kill him. Right? If they hadn't, he would never got there. But the great secret was that was deliverance. I think this is the closest you get to the mystery being in the Old Testament. It's not there. But as we know the mystery now, we look back, we go, wow, had they had known that before, they, who knows if they'd have sold him into Egypt, right? If they had known by sold him, selling him into Egypt that he would have been the great leader of Egypt, would they, were they trying to bless him? No. Of course, at the end of the story, they felt guilty for what they had done and they, didn't, they regretted what they did, right? And so... You see, it's a similar situation now with the mystery, even though, again, I, I need to emphasize the mystery is not back here, but we can see the story of salvation where Christ needed to die. And we know he needed to die, but nobody knew the reason why he needed to die, except according to the mystery. And if they hadn't known it, they wouldn't have crucified him. Right? We're in Genesis chapter 45, right? The great reveal, the great deliverance here. Joseph says, God, you intended it for evil. He says in chapter 50, God sent me here before you to preserve life, preserve you a posterity, a future, a family in the earth. That was the promise God made to Abraham. I'm going to bless you and make your seed multiply. And, and he's, God did it. Remember a few chapters ago, we, we covered that in detail. It wasn't Joseph. God was with Joseph. God prospered Joseph. God was with him. The Lord was with him. 
All right. Verse eight. So now it was not you that sent me here, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste you, hurry up, go to my father and say unto him, Thus saith my, thy son Joseph, God hath made me the Lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not. Wow. So here's, he made me the Lord of lords, right? And verse 10, And then shalt thou dwell in the land of Goshen. And so you've heard the songs and the hymns about going to the land of Goshen. And uh, they're talking about heaven spiritually, and that's not what this is talking about. It's literal Goshen. Okay. And uh, Israel's promised a literal land. But it says, Joseph says, Come down to Goshen here, this fertile land, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine. Okay, and so he said in verse 12, Behold your eyes see. Today in this dispensation, we walk by faith. Right? Not by sight. We're not looking out there and saying, What a righteous kingdom we live in. It's not here. Okay? We walk by faith and what Christ did on the cross for us when he died and rose from the dead. And we walk by faith that in the future, you know, we're going to be resurrected in heavenly places. Israel would have faith. We understand the truth that Israel's kingdom comes in the future. It's not now. But here, Joseph says, you see with your eyes, I am your brother, and I am the Lord of all Egypt. This is the kingdom happening for them, right? right? That, that, this is the kingdom in the future to Israel. That's when they see that's when it becomes real to them. But here their eyes see in the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that is my mouth that speaks unto you. And so Benjamin knows his brother Joseph, you know. And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. All my glory. Wow. Isn't that what Israel's going to do when Christ returns? They're going to start preaching his glory to all the land, all the Gentiles? That's what he says. Go and tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen. And ye shall haste and bring down my father here. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. It seems such a small thing to say his brothers talked to him. Okay, but it's such a huge story. And this is where you roll credits right here because back in chapter 37, it says his brothers could not speak to him because they hated him so much. And here, they're, they're talking. Here's all the brothers, and they're talking together, and they're, they're loving each other, and they're hugging each other. This is redemption, folks. This is reconciliation. This is salvation. What a beautiful story. And it goes on. We don't have time tonight to go on, but it goes on where they go and get their father, and they bring him back into the land, and they're rejoicing together because now he sees his son resurrected. And look at this. And then he blesses the Gentile kings because they blessed God's kingdom. And you have a picture of the millennium back here. Right? We only know that because we have the rest of the Bible. This was written 1700 B.C., you know, thousands of years ago. How does it, how does it have all those little things that seem to picture what will come? It's, it's fascinating. And so we see in this story that it was Judah's idea, it was the brother's idea to sell Joseph into slavery, to kill him, right? To hate him. And yet it was God's purpose to send Joseph to Egypt to save his people, to fulfill his purpose. That's the point. God's purpose from the beginning of the world is for man to have dominion on the earth. He gave that promise to Abraham that his family would bless the earth and to Isaac and to Jacob. That was the purpose. That was the will God was doing. And he's fulfilling it here in Joseph, saving his people, fulfilling his purpose. Right? And they're going to end up growing and multiplying and being prosperous because they're in Egypt, because they have this access. And they're going to grow into a great nation when it comes to Exodus chapter 1. Right? And that nation God's going to deliver once again when they become slaves. So um, we see God's promise fulfilled here in Genesis chapter 45. Any, any questions? Yeah, I, I think it's right on an hour, folks. I can't believe you did that. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> That's a new record. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> any thoughts about this story? It's a great story. I encourage you to go back and read it verse to verse because there's a lot of good information and you, and you get to see the, the dialogue and everything. So it's a great story. I don't think it has much impact, but I find it somewhat interesting that uh, in the middle of a famine, they have these huge meals and feasts. And yeah, yeah, in Egypt. Kind of go, go on. What, what, imagine right. what the, uh, the Egyptians are seeing. He's giving all their food. Yeah. Well, of course, the Egyptians had bread because of Joseph's uh, wisdom. So the Egyptian uh, people, I mean, they, they, had, they were not experiencing the famine like the other lands. I mean, back in chapter uh, 41. Since all the lands came to Egypt to, to get bread and that sort of thing. We'll cover next week some details about the famine because it deals with uh, how Egypt grew because of Joseph's wisdom in this famine. 
and how he bought up more land and more land because nobody had any money to buy with that sort of thing. But, but yeah, the Egyptians, um, because God, again, had prospered them, had stuff. They're having this feast, but uh, I don't know. I kind of relate this to, to, to our country as well. <laughs> Where, I mean, you look at the world over, and there's lots of people starving, and yet you go home tonight and stuff yourself with pizza and mac and cheese or something, you know. Um, and so, <laughs> I don't know if it's, it's much different. But. I think I've asked you before, too, uh, and I don't remember if you specifically knew, but in, uh, i got to try to find it, where it goes back and forth between Jacob and Israel, is mm -hmm. there any real significance to that? Why in one chapter, the end of 40... I don't know if it was 43 and in the beginning of 44, uh -huh. his name is Jacob, and then yeah. it's, I guess, is there anything to that? Yeah, well, we'll probably talk about that briefly next week, because in the next chapter it does that too, Jacob and Israel, Jacob and Israel. But um, there's no verse that says anything about that, except that we have when God named Jacob Israel, you know, and, and why he did that, it was related to his purpose and his promise. So some, some commentators speculate when they take all the verses and they go back and for, uh, forth, to think that uh, when it mentions Jacob and calls him Jacob, it's him walking in his flesh or not doing right exactly. But when they call him Israel, it's him doing God's will. I don't know if that works every time you find it, but that's what people speculate. And so you saw back uh, back when when uh, Judah was talking to him about taking Benjamin back to the land. The first time when Reuben talked to him, he talked about Jacob, and he said that he wasn't going to send Benjamin. And then Judah talked to him, and it said, and then Israel said, "Go and take Benjamin and take your brother." So you have there. Jacob resisting sending Benjamin. They called him Jacob. And then Israel, same guy, sending Benjamin, which is what God would want him wanted to happen. So you have that speculation, but I don't know if there's any. You can't be real adamant about that. I don't think. But Israel's the name God gave him. So uh, you have the time of Jacob's trouble, not Israel's trouble. Why is that? Well, because it's referencing this, and you know, it's it's Israel in their suffering and their and their. Their flesh part. It's not Israel's rise, it's kind of Israel's suffering, their trouble. Any other thoughts? All right, when Grace Ambassador's Productions puts on the movie, I'll be asking for casting characters. <laughs> All right. Let's say a prayer and we'll wrap up tonight. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you so much for your word. It's such an amazing book with so many treasures that we can find in it from beginning to end. And we thank you that it's so cohesive. It's so easy to understand and to see this, the, the message you're trying to communicate to, to people throughout history. And as we understand the revelation of your mystery and, and know the manifold wisdom that you've hidden since the world began, we, we so thank you for, for giving us that understanding. I pray we would grow in that. We would walk worthy of having that information that we would not hide it from people, but preach the gospel clearly and uh, make known how they can operate, be members of your body and your church. And uh, again, I thank you for Genesis and the people who come here tonight. Amen. Thank you, folks.